you're not prepared again, Mike. All right. Welcome, everybody, to Cycle Jerks Podcast. I'm Mike Stewart, your host, and I'm joined, as always, by Dave Dalton. Dave, how are you today? Great. I'm super excited about today's guest. So, yeah, I'm doing good. Had a good weekend. I got a ride in this morning before the heat, so life is good. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, I never know with you. It sounds a little sarcastic when you say you're good, but I'll we'll go uh, with usually it. Not. So, yeah. <laughs> usually not. Usually not. So a lot of times there is sarcasm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, today we're excited to have back a returning guest. Uh, Danville uh, Chief of Police, uh, Alan Shields, is joining us today. And we're going to talk some e-mobility uh, and some of the issues surrounding e-mobility. Alan, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Thanks for yeah, having me back. Welcome, welcome back. Welcome back. Yeah. Before yeah. we get into e-bikes, though, can I just say one thing, Alan? Yeah. I get tired just following you on Strava. You you <laughs> walk, you run, you swim, you do these hit workouts. It's like yeah. I, I squeeze in my two hours in a given day, and all of a sudden I look, and I, I must give you kudos four times a day. So I get to, so keep up the good work, man. That's I think good. that's what happens when you have a job that has you sitting down most of the day. You have to find right. any reason to get up and just move your body. Yeah, And, right. and frankly, that's, um, I'll, I'll let you in on a secret. My wife and I, our date day is the, the morning gym workout. So we go to the gym every morning and that's a way that we can stay connected in a pretty positive and real way. Yeah, and then in the afternoon, it. you'll see me go do something, you know, my lunch hour, or a nice long weekend ride. But I want to share with you, I actually had some fun rides. You know, it was really, oh, really hot up in uh, Northern California where we're at. And one of the rides I had that was pretty fun was uh, we have a boat up at Lake Berryessa. And okay. so I rode my bike from Danville to Lake Berryessa, which is about 70 miles. But I decided to leave at about 10 o'clock and I ended somewhere near two o'clock. Okay. And, uh, it was, I think I ended at like 96, 97 degrees. Oh boy. It was nice. I was cooking. So when you, <laughs> Dave, when you mentioned that you got your ride in before it got hot, I think yeah. sometimes I wait too long and, uh, I just like to get punished by the heat or something, but it was I, a beautiful I love, ride. I love the concept yeah. that I, I want to get to the topic, but we had a wedding up in Camino, which is 120 miles over the weekend. And I thought about riding up or riding back and it was Solely the temperatures that said, no, yeah. that's just stupid. <laughs> I mean, it was, yeah. 105, it was 105 degrees up there. I was sitting in a shirt and a tie and dress pants sitting outside at a wedding. So, yeah, oh, I did I try one ride once going from Auburn to Danville and it was on a hot day and I was supposed to leave really early. And I think about Dixon Davis, about the hundred mile mark, um, my body just started cramping up. It was clear. I didn't have enough oh electrolytes yeah. and water and it was, uh, it was it was really bad. I had to have my wife come pick me up. I think at about 110 miles and it was brutal. Did not like it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I listen, well, we're I, trying anyways. But yeah, I, Mike. I'm encouraged by the fact that you're getting after it so much. You know, I mean, I remember when I was a kid riding around Livermore, like a lot of the policemen were heavy and, you know, uh, you know, they're in law enforcement, right? There, uh, there's situations where you got to, be on the run or jump a fence or who knows what kind of situations might in, you might incur. And I just remember as a, you know, like a rebellious teenager looking at some of these guys thinking, there's no way that dude's catching me if I'm, if I want to run, you know, but uh, I know you can't run the outrun the radio, but uh, it does seem like now there is um, like policemen in general are generally in pretty good shape. Is that yeah. something that has like formally changed within the different uh, public service, you know, criteria, or uh, is it just kind of organically happened just due to the nature of the job? I, actually, I think both. I, you know, there is an organic push, but also I think there's a an overt effort uh, by by staff, by managers, by heads of agencies to really look after the wellness of officers because we know if an officer feels good, if they're healthy, they're going to provide better service. They're going to have a longer, more healthy career. And then in the end, when they decide they're financially free and they can retire, they're going to be healthy in retirement. Uh, I think far too often, 20 and 30 years ago, we'd see officers, you know, work their entire career and then decline sharper than, uh, you know, a rock falling off a cliff. And it just isn't good. Uh, yeah. But I will say this, officers do come in all shapes and sizes. And you'd be amazed because I did challenge one of our officers that I didn't think was as fit as he was just to see if he could do 10 pull-ups in all of his gear. And I mean, he did some 
incredible dead hang pull-ups and proved to me that he was a beast for strength. <laughs> so I, I don't, I don't judge by appearance so much anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I have a little story like that too. Like for years, I, I coached baseball, you know, my kids were growing up and um, my assistant coach was a, you know, he's kind of a big dude. He's a lawyer, heavy set guy. And uh, we would always run these, these big, long laps. He wasn't there all the time, but when he was there, so and I told him, I said, Hey, I'm beating these kids. That's, that's the deal because they don't like <laughs> to run. They're going to let some old man beat them. So yeah. I would run hard. And then, uh, so Norm and I, I think we ran together in front of all the kids and we got them going. They were, they were running hard trying to keep with it, but we'd, we'd go to the end of the park we'd hit this tree. And then it was a sprint back to home plate. He dropped me like, like nothing. Yeah. And uh, if you would have looked at the two of us, there's no way you're picking him to win the yeah. race. But he just had some, he played linebacker in, in college, you know. I football yeah. players are different animals. They can yeah. move a lot of weight really quick and really yeah. fast. I mean, be yeah. careful. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. All right. Well, it's good this, you're in shape and segue, all. segue, Mike, if you will, though. I mean, to yes. that point, just to make the segue, I think we're very fortunate here in Danville and as fortunate as our guests because – it, not only are you active, but as you mentioned, Alan, you're an, you're an active, active cyclist. So that has put a whole different spin on what we're going to talk about today and some of the other podcasts that we, we've heard. And it's, I think it's endeared yourself and your department uh, to a lot of the cyclists because they know that it's not, I don't want to say that you, they know you're on your on our side, but you know you have you you know the facts right and you know there are rights and it's always been great to have you as a guest and and to speak to you on this topic and i think it's why you you're so um it's so important to have you speak on the topic of electric vehicles as well yeah and i think a lot of it when we look at it uh people always see law enforcement as like an oppressive force and really what we try to do is we try to help various communities not just survive an environment like how do we navigate this environment of electric vehicles but we want people to thrive we recognize that e-mobility, e-bikes, e-scooters are an excellent way for people to, to get around that may not have otherwise gotten around. And actually, I'll share a story with you real quick. We, it just mm -hmm. popped into my head. But yeah. we were mountain biking. I think it was either at Chabot or the L Lake in Livermore. It's escape, escaping my mind. But it's a, oh, it no. was a hilly, hilly oh, no. course. I mean, it was really hilly. And we get after this monster climb. My wife and I, we get to the top and we see an, a, a couple who's – if you just looked at them, you'd say they were in their, their early sixties, but clearly they were early seventies. And we, we asked them and they both were on e-bikes. And this is a couple of years ago, e or probably about four years ago when e-bikes were starting to get real popular. Mm -hmm. And we asked them how they liked their e-bikes. And, and this is what stuck with me. They looked at each other, they both smiled and they said, we love them because it allows us to do something that we've done our whole lives that we thought we aged out of. We thought we couldn't ride these Hills anymore. We couldn't be together in this way anymore but allows us to stay connected to something that we, we love to do. And I was like, wow, like how great is that? Like that's extending fitness. That's extending life. That's extending this, this activity that this couple was able to do yeah. for that much longer. So it's just, it's an incredible thing. And so that's what we look for. We look for opportunities for people to thrive. We don't want people to just survive these, these culture shifts. We want them to thrive within them. Mm -hmm. Love it. Love it. well that's great. uh that's great that's a that's a good perspective to have you know like you said uh a lot of people you know think of the police as like uh oh here come the police <laughs> yeah <laughs> or whatever uh but um yeah and we've seen it in the bike world i mean there was uh some pretty serious division initially with the uh, acoustic riders and the e-riders mm -hmm. and uh but most of that squashed now um throughout my entire territory i cover all in northern a lot of northern california and um you know some zones are um were still kind of um resistant to e-bikes up until just the last year or so and um it's just it's taken over i mean there's no denying it it's super fun you don't have to be an athlete um it is athletic to get out on an e-bike and go work out you know you're getting a good workout but it doesn't require you to be some type a maniac and um and you can just have a good time it, it basically takes the good time part of it and and makes that the, the whole ride you know whereas if you're on an acoustic bike, there's times where it's 
you know, you're really putting in the work and it's not so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> there are moments when it's not so much fun. Right. Believe so, it or not. yeah, it's, it's, it's been awesome as a, somebody in the industry to watch it evolve and to see where it is today. And you see so many different types of riders on e-bikes. And that's the thing that's great, whether it's older couples or uh, sometimes you see like a whole group, like maybe six or seven people. And it'd be like husbands and wives and, and daughters and sons and all different body types and fitness levels. And everybody's just riding together and having a good time. So yeah. uh, it really does open up a lot of opportunities for people that otherwise just wouldn't do it. Yeah. yeah, I think it's open up for people to get into it. Yeah. Um, but also, too, I mean, I ride with a, a lot of hardcore cyclists. And, and Alan, to your point, I, you know, there's I, nowadays there's very few of them that won't say, yeah, I, I need bikes in my future at some point, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it is come Mike, it is come to that acceptance level within the cycling community that they are legit and they're great. Uh, forms of uh, of cycling and and fitness and whatnot, but let's get to the heart of the matter, right? And you know, not all e bikes are, if you will, created equals. And let's let's face it, some of the one of the reasons that we're here is some of these things that are passing as e bikes just aren't bikes at all. And that's where I think that that's the heart of this, and why I was so anxious to have you on, Alan, and just. I'm, I, I fear for the industry. I fear for people's safety. Um, uh, and so I, I don't even know, even know where to start from there. But let's well, I think just... maybe this will help kick the conversation off. And let, let's really divide what we're talking about. And you have, um, you have you know, class one, two, and three e-bikes. Perfect. Yep. And then we'll talk about power scooters or motorized scooters. And then we'll say everything else, right? Because mm -hmm. I think that's the distinction we want to make because that's where – we in law enforcement, at least that's where we find there to be the most uh, amount of misinformation that, that people don't have a good grasp of that. And so the easiest way to think about it is that a level one or two e-scooter, or I'm sorry, level one or two e-bike is capped at 750 watts and is either pedal or throttle assisted up to 20 miles an hour. That's it. And uh, you have to be, you can, you can be any age to ride those. If you're under 18, you have to wear a helmet. Uh, and locally here, and you have to check your local ordinances, but locally here, we have a trail system through the East Bay Regional Parks District. And in my town, we have what's called the Iron Horse Trail. They've actually allowed them on the Iron Horse Trail. And the reason they do that is because it's capable of, of the lower speeds. And what they there's a strict prohibition on motorized vehicles on the trail. And what they did was with the proliferation of e-bikes, they've allowed class one and two to be on there, which is good. Mm -hmm. uh, now, class three e-bikes are those that can go 28 miles an hour on pedal assist. Now, those you have oh, to be wow. 16 to ride. Uh, everyone that rides one has to wear a helmet. And uh, and those cannot be ridden on the Iron Horse Trail. Now, on the road, I'll let you all clearly class... Back up, can, can I back yeah. up, though? That at 28, there's no throttle, correct? It's just no, no it's throttle. pedal. Right. Yeah, I, just want to make, miles... I knew that. I just want to make clarification. Yeah, 28 miles an hour, it's pedal assist only. Right. Yep. Yeah. And then on the on the so on the road, so class one, two, and three e-bikes, they follow the exact same rules as a regular bicycle. And so they they must ride on the right side of the road. If there's a bike lane, be in the bike lane, stop at stop signs and stop lights and, and all of those. And a lot of them are behavior driven uh functions. Well, and I think what happens is is we often confuse an e-bike with what we would call either a motor-driven cycle, a moped, or an off-highway motorcycle. When I use the word off-highway motorcycle, just think of dirt bike. That's the best way to think of it. Okay. Uh, all of those can have electric power. Typically, they go either under 30 miles an hour, some will go more than 30, but all of those classifications, they actually have to be registered. Uh, so okay. if you're riding a moped, it has to be registered with DMV. An e-bike doesn't need registration, insurance, any of that. But a moped, a motor-driven cycle, those must be registered for the road. You must wear a DOT helmet, like a motorcycle helmet, not a bicycle helmet. Okay. Um, yeah. And then you have to follow the rules of the road as well. Now, the one that's a little bit apart, which can be really, really confusing, and it really doesn't make sense, is the motor-driven cycle. So I, I will be up front 
that the confusion is probably on our, the legislators end, our end of it. And that a, a motorized scooter, which typically they go between 15 and 20 miles an hour, the max they're supposed to go is 15. Uh, you have to have either a driver's license or a permit to ride one on the road. And that's what confuses people because you can get an e-bike that goes, you know, 20 miles an hour, but this scooter that only goes 15, you need a license. Um, My scooter, and, and, you're talking like something that looks like one of those razor scooters that you stand on and, and yeah, the e-scooter is defined as something with, uh, typically two wheels, a pad for you to stand on and handlebars and it's throttle only. There is no pedal assist. There's no, right. there's okay. no pedaling. So yeah. it's a motorized scooter, two wheels that you stand on and, and you ride. And if you remember back, like about 10 years ago, these started to get really, really popular. And then you started getting companies doing ride share models, which were wildly popular. You could just jump mm -hmm. on a corner, grab one, go to where you want to go, leave it where it is. Hugely popular. Well, the problem they were having is people weren't following the rules of the road. Yes. So people were weaving in and out of traffic. They were creating hazardous road conditions. Uh, they were also riding them on the sidewalk and, and there were crashes reporting in some of our bigger cities. And then they would also just leave them laying in the side on the sidewalk, oh, creating yeah. a hazard for people trying to walk. And so what the legislator did during that time was they said, what is the best way to make sure people are following the rules of the road? Well, make sure they have a license. So they made that requirement. How do we keep them from riding on the sidewalks? Make it so you can never ride an electric scooter on the sidewalk. So even if I have a 16-year-old with a license, they cannot ride an electric scooter on the sidewalk. And then you can't leave one standing or lying on the sidewalk. So the, the rules with e-scooters are very restrictive, and it's a result of bad behavior on the, uh, on the use of those uh, rideshare scooters. Right. Well, but you're, it, you're just kind of, I mean, you're a bit outnumbered in that case, right? So I would submit that, you know, many of the parents that are buying these things don't know that, right? And therefore, ipso facto, their kids don't know that. And so they're riding them and think, well, I just got a motorized Razor scooter, so I can go anywhere. And that's in, in, I mean, how much, I mean, how big is your police force? You can't be everywhere all the time. So it's got to be a difficult challenge to even enforce it, right? It is challenging, but what we do is we try to take the the most practical approach we can. And so one of the things we did is we paired with our local school district. Uh, one of our assistant principals actually moderated a quick interview with me, and they put it out to every parent in the school district. Oh, wow. Also, most what we found is most of the people using the scooters it's not for us in our community. It's not 16 and 17 year old kids. It's your 13, 14 and 15 year olds. And most of those go to middle school. And so okay. what we found is if we just go to the middle school bike corral, all the kids that are riding them are right there. So instead of us trying to go out and find the violators one at a time, we would go and what we would do is we'd hand out little flyers to all the kids and have their parents give us a call. So a lot in the way of personal community engagement in order to work on the edu education part that we're talking about today. Great. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. And so you're, and I, again, I think I know the answer to this, Alan, but you're Danville, but we have people from all over the U S that are listening. This is local legislation thing, or that is the policy of e-scooters kind of almost nationwide or, or is it just well, very specific? Yeah. So the e-scooter laws I'm talking about as far as having to have a license, no riding on a sidewalk and, uh, um, no leaving them lying on a sidewalk. Those are all vehicle codes. So those apply to any, any area in the state of California. Uh, as far Perfect. as other States, I, I don't know. I know there are some there, that yeah. have en enacted some similar laws, but I can only speak to, uh, to California. So that's big vehicle codes. Okay. So that means it's just not, you know, it's, okay. That's awesome. Great. Yeah. Now let's, how about these, uh, this, like I keep seeing these Sarans, uh, these motorcycle, they look like motorcycles. The kids all call them e-bikes. Uh, a lot of people refer to them as e-bikes, but they're not, they're not really an e-bike. And, um, that is, is there any restrictions on these bikes currently, um, can they ride them through town? Because I see them all the time, and I'm, I live in Livermore, and they're ripping through downtown all the time. These kids. So, you know? 
<laughs> it's funny that you say Livermore. We were at the outlets and I actually recorded it and I meant to download it off my car, but I recorded because there were about six Sarans riding by in front of me, right yeah. in front of the outlet stores. And one of them was doing just a, a beautiful wheelie the whole way down the road. <laughs> I mean, it was I, I wanted to applaud him as I was hitting the record button because it was great. And and I sure. looked and and this is the struggle that we have in law enforcement is I can look at those kids and I can say that is a lot of fun. I, oh, yeah. I'm I would love to be doing what they're doing. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying that the act isn't fun. I'm not saying that riding the bike in that way isn't a lot of fun. The problem that we have is is bikes like the Saran, the one that's in this picture. Yeah. You, that is that is functionally a dirt bike is uh, the vehicle code would call it an off highway motorcycle, meaning that it is intended yeah. only for off highway that you cannot even register that for the road. So it okay. has no business ever being on the road. It can't be on the road. It can't be on the iron horse trail or any of our trail systems. It really is meant for off highway use. And there's a lot of places you can go, just not really local to here. And so I'm afraid that parents buy this because it's got an electric motor. And what we do is we put the blanket term e-bike on everything that's got an electric motor and they call it an e-bike. Yep. And then I'll take a step further because there's companies that go between a dirt bike and between an e-bike and they look more like the old school trail bikes. If you remember those. Mm -hmm. And if you go to their website, yeah. Yeah. If you go to their website, they'll actually say that it is a class one, a class two, a class three and an off-road bike. Oh. And I don't know how you can be all those things at the same time because they all have different definitions. And uh -huh. they'll say nominal power at 750, actual power at 1200 watts. Well, that puts it outside the classification of an e-bike. And the law is pretty clear. If, if that vehicle is capable of doing more than its classification by speed or by watts and motor, it is no longer an e-bike. And so even in the way that they're advertising, it would lead a parent to believe that this is an acceptable e-bike and I can put my child on the bike and it's okay. And so that is, that is the struggle is they're being given different information from these companies. So that, that is one of the struggles that we come to is, is they're not all, they're not all e-bikes, even though some might pretend and say they're a certain class bike. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm so glad you brought that up. I didn't want to pick on Saron just because I, cause I mean, that in fact does look like a motorcycle, but you know, if you look at almost any e-bike company that is not from one of the big manufacturers, giant, track, specialized, whatever, they're going to have, they have a lot of these look that look bikes and they fall into those classifications, but there is always one on the website, right? And I, I mean, that looks like what I would say is my old mini bike that I had with, uh, you know, um, when we used to put the Briggs and Stratton lawnmower engine on there, you yeah. know, and it looked like a, a mini bike. Yeah. The only difference is really that these things do have pedals and they provide that option to allow mm -hmm. these kids to pedal. So maybe that's how it falls into. And, but yet I see these kids at that same middle school that you're referring to. And I ask them, how fast does that thing go? And they go, Oh, mine's 33 miles in a row. Yeah. And I'm like, we, Oh no, that's like just, freaking dangerous and so yeah I, I i blame i blame the manufacturers for the for that and i you know I, I don't i can't solve that but i just think we need to do our best to educate parents and uh, er, educate parents and and just uh, whoever else that this is not legal yeah and that's and, and that's a great legal. pivot because a lot of times i think what happens is we look at the law and what does the law say and and the fact is laws are, are a best attempt at, at keeping society in certain bounds, right? In this particular case, when it comes to traffic safety, it's trying to tamp down those conditions that result in fatal collisions. Like that's what we're trying to reduce. Yeah. And we don't have good statistics or studies on uh, auto versus bike or auto versus scooter accidents, but we do have good statistics on our auto versus pedestrian. And what it, what I'm trying to represent, I'm going to show something here, but what I'm trying to represent is the effect of a car, a solid object on a body. And what is the likelihood that there will be a fatality based on speed? So if you think about it, an e-bike by definition goes somewhere between 20 and 28 miles an hour maximum, right? Um, 
And then these bikes that we're talking about, and you just mentioned 33 miles an hour. I know some go up to 40. So I'm going to show this chart real quick. But if you look at 23 miles per hour, an auto versus pedestrian accident, it's about a 10% likelihood that that accident will be a fatal collision. When you go to 37 miles per hour, it jumps all the way up to 50. So one in two. So one in two of an auto versus a pet accident, if the speed is 37 miles an hour, one in two will be fatal. And this is a, a this is a huge, huge study. This is actually, it's not an individual study. It was a, a systemic uh, systematic review and meta-analysis of I think 40 or 50 different studies. So it is, it is the accurate, the data is very, very accurate. And that in and of itself should concern a parent that you're taking a child and you're sticking them in a helmet meant for a bicycle, meant for collisions at what I would consider relative to a motorcycle, low speeds. Yeah. And you're putting them on a motorcycle without proper safety equipment and without the knowledge on how to even navigate the rules of the road, stopping and stop signs, stop lights, all those things. So the conditions are such that we feel these fatal collisions are inevitable if we allow the conditions to continue. And that's why we really want to impress upon people. There is a difference between e-bikes and a lot of these other things that people may think are e-bikes. And here's what I'm afraid of. And I, I know it is predictable. If we start having quote bicycles with kids traveling 37 42 miles an hour. And if it, you hit 42 miles an hour, the, the percentage goes up to 75% fatality rate. So we wow. know that if we've got kids running around town at those speeds, that type of a collision, sorry about that. We know that if they're running at those speeds, that type of collision is inevitable and it's going to happen. And what we're afraid of is if you look down in uh, Key Biscayne, Florida, if you just Google that when we're done here, mm -hmm. there was a pretty, pretty bad accident. And I don't know the details of the accident, but what I do know is it was a child that was on an e-bike that collided with a lady. That lady eventually died. And when I say the kid was on an e-bike, I don't know what kind of bike it was because that's what the news called it. Got it. As a result of the collision, the lady died and Key Biscayne, I think for a 60 day period outlawed all electric bikes, okay. everything with a motor. And until they could do a study and determine how they were going to move forward. So that's my fear is we're going to take bad behavior by really a small portion of the community. And it's going to have this negative effect on a large group of people that are out there responsibly riding their e-bikes, doing well, being way more mobile than they could be otherwise. Yeah. And we just don't want to see that negative effect. And so we want to do our part on the education. And frankly, in my community, we're starting to move to enforcement. Um, and, and we want to make sure that we tamp that down. We don't want to have one of those tragedies. Yeah. Well, I, I want to be clear on something. So the, your statistic that you just held up, right? So a, is that saying that a car traveling at that speed hits a pedestrian and the death, it's 37% or uh, almost 50%. And then there was a reason for me and I'll, I'll bring up my reason. So uh, a pedestrian gets hit by a car traveling at that speed and the likelihood that they'll die is, is 50%. that graph going on, yes. right? Yes. Okay. So here's, here's what my biggest concern about that, right? Stating the obvious potentially. So when does that happen? That happens when some kid or some person is not paying attention. They step off a curb, boom, they get hit by a car. Uh, they're walking or they're, they're a runner. They're running down the road. Someone's a distracted driver and they, they hit that, right? So I would submit that the frequency with which that happens, it, while tragic, may not be as big. When you compare it now, you've put these kids on an e-bike that are zooming all over the place and and not like and just spending more time in the road, right? There's more of them. They're spending more time in the road and being less observant. They're not crossing necessarily at crosswalks. They're riding, you know, I, I mean, I've seen them riding down the middle of Camino Tassajara, right? And so it just seems to me that not only are the speeds going to be at that higher end, but the frequency, and there's probably maybe not be any data, but the frequency will go up because it's just there because the pure, the person on that bike is, is more apt to put themselves in harm's way, I think is, is where I'm going versus 
the person that just is looking at their phone and inadvertently steps off the curb, right? Okay. So, so Dave, that's a pretty interesting observation. A couple of things for those listening: Camino de Sahara is a forty-five mile an hour road that most people you. go fifty-five to sixty miles an hour. Yeah. Uh, so to ride something like an e-bike, uh, it's a very dangerous road. Uh, it's not that it's uh, it's it's striped very well. There's certainly signs and signals and all those things out there. But if you get into an accident at those speeds, it's it's going to get really bad. Uh, in fact, at 50 miles an hour uh, per this study at 50 miles an hour, and you can go to sciencedirect.com for the study at 50 miles an hour, it's a 90% likelihood of a fatal collision. So yeah, when you're talking about the speeds that people go on Camino de Sahara, that is, is certainly likely, but here's, here's the observational behavior that we see in law enforcement is we have, we also Danville, for those that aren't aware, Danville is a relatively low crime city. We get... We're constantly at the top for safest cities. Uh, we do very, very well. And when I say we, I frankly, I mean all the community members because we have very few cops. We're actually statistically very low. We're at 0.67 per 1,000. So 0.67 officers per 1,000. Most cities in this county are at about 1.2. So we're almost a little more than half of the staffing. So the credit, the kudos, it really goes to everyone in the community agreeing to live by a set of laws and values that say we will do certain things in furtherance of a good community. Um, and so what usually happens is we, the police will ring the bell and say, Hey, lock your doors, uh, you know, make sure you have cameras and lights and all these crime prevention strategies that we know have a, a pretty good effect. And what will happen is, is we'll get, uh, like it happened a couple of weeks ago, we'll get a group of people that will come in and they went through unlocked cars, they got garage door openers, went in garages, and they stole everything they could that was in plain sight because there was a lot of stuff in plain sight. This looked like Nordstrom's for crooks, right? It was a You're great right. store to come shopping in. Yeah. And so then what happens is then the, the effect, the feeling hits the community. And now they have the reaction and they start locking the doors. They start putting up cameras and motion lights and they don't have their garage doors inside their cars. Uh, and that's, that's the struggle is we, we call out the predictive, right? We say, Hey, we can predict that if there's like Dave says, a lot of these scooters, a lot of these e-bikes that aren't e-bikes driving improperly in the road, the conditions are set to have a catastrophic event. But then what happens is you get the catastrophic event, you get the car broken into, your house broken into, you get a child that gets seriously hurt, then the community becomes charged and then parents start to take action, right? right. Um, and what we're trying to say is don't wait for the child to be hurt. Don't wait for someone to get hurt. Listen to us, use us as your shield and say, you know, the police are telling us that this is very dangerous. These studies are telling us that if you get hit by a car, if not fatal, you're going to have a serious injury. It's going to be bad. And so we're not going to let you do that. And I'll share a personal story. So my middle son, Ethan is an excellent mountain biker. He is very good. He would just crush me. I didn't, I'm slow uphill, slow downhill. He hits about 14, 15 years old. And he's like, dad, I think I want to sell my bike and get one of those off highway motorcycle brands. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I look at it and ask him like, well, where are you going to ride it? And then he's showing me the videos and I have to admit the videos were pretty appealing. I wanted one. I was sure. like, that looks like a lot of fun. And, but I looked at it and he told me, he's like, yeah, I'm going to ride it on Las Trompas, which is an open space ridge line in this area, which I know those are not allowed on. And then right. he tells me, or I can ride it. And he picks another location, which I know aren't allowed on. And then of course I know the only way for him to get there is to ride this thing, which I know isn't allowed on the road, on the road. Mm -hmm. And so I had to tell him no. And right. I told him why I said, you know, you're going to drive it exactly how I would at 14 years old. And so I can't put you in that risk. So I had to be the parent in that moment and say, no, I, I can't get it for you. Yeah. As much as yeah. I would have loved to have him have it, it wouldn't have been appropriate given the conditions he was going to ride it in. What, well, with that in mind, where can they ride these things? Yeah, a lot of it, uh, frankly, not around here. And I know that's not the answer anyone with one of those bikes wants to hear, but you have to go to an approved location. So it could be your own private property. Uh, we've got a lot, if you go out to the east end of town, we've got a lot of people that have private property. In fact, Highland Road, we went out one day, someone has on their property, a little track that they set up crazy, and it looks right? like it's Isn't for, it beautiful? Yeah. yeah, it's for, I was like, oh my gosh, why aren't we living there? Like, I'm so, <laughs> so jealous, uh, yeah. but it's a great place, right? And you're not worried about cars. You're not worried about any of that. And then you can go to some of your larger, you know, your Carnegie and Hollister where off highway 
motorcycles and vehicles are permitted to be. Right. Uh, so there are locations. It's just not the road. Like, okay. So basically OHV or private property. Exactly. It, do you know, like uh, out here there's club moto, I but do. that's, that's like full motorcycle. C can they take these? I mean, are they, I don't know. Are they capable yeah, I, of riding so, out there with them? And so Mike, I haven't been to club moto, so I, I just don't know what their rules are. Yeah. Okay. That, that is a private location and yeah. I don't know what their specific rules are. Yeah. But Cause I, I think mean, that's the, I think Mike, yeah. I think that's exactly the point is, you know, if I were going to buy a Jeep to go off-roading with, I would, I would figure out where I could drive that Jeep. Right. Uh, yeah. if I was going to buy one of these off highway motorcycles for my child, I would want to know, okay, well, where can I ride it? And so do a little bit of research ahead of buying the gift because we don't want the gift to spoil the time for the kid. Yeah. Or worse. I think that that comes back to the heart of the problem that, you know, I, again, I, as I said, before we logged on, I, I suspect, you know, there's there's this many parents that have bought these things, right? And there's a probably a very large percentage of those that did so thinking they were doing the right thing because it was said it was an e-bike. And they said, well, great, now I don't have to drive my kid to, to school, one less car on the road and all that. And I just don't know what they, you know, I don't know what they fit. They don't know what they've got, right? And and now the cost of failure is, and this is why this is so important, is so great, right? I mean, you can replace that bike or that big screen TV that was stolen out of their garage when they, somebody got their garage opener, you know, 75% and not coming back, right? And that's what's so disturbing and and frankly upsetting to me. It just, uh, when, I, when I see it, right? Is there, I mean, any, frankly, is there anything that can be done gonna, about this, uh, marketing of this product that uh, where these companies are misrepresenting facts, making it confusing. And I mean, is there any type of um, action that can prevent that from happening? So there is a bill going through legislation right now, and they're trying to work on the classification of, of bikes and the manufacturers having to be upfront about that. But, but here's the thing. And, and this is where I, I, I really hit on what Dave is talking about. Really, I think working with parents to educate them because they're ultimately the final decision makers. We didn't have any of this when I was a kid, right? Mm -hmm. Yet my brothers both had some Yamaha 80s sitting in the garage. Ah, uh, nice. And my dad said, hey, I'll take you out to, you know, Hollister, Carnegie, wherever. Do not ride these while I'm at work. Mm -hmm. right. And what right. did my brothers do? Because they're boys. This is what they, they wrote do. them. Yeah, they took them out. And right. then someone called my dad, said, hey, your boys are out riding in the middle of the street. Oh boy. My dad came home. This is kind of a, this is an old story, but so my dad came home and he cut the fuel lines and the tires on both those motorcycles and said, now you can't ride them. And yeah. that was it right. because my dad took on the responsibility to say, I, I'm, I'm going to allow you to use these under certain conditions. If you violate those rules, I will make sure you can't ride them. Yeah. And so really that's our goal is to educate the parents that when you're going 37 miles an hour, and if you get hit by a car, that risk is is one in two. And are you willing to put your child in that type of a risk? Right. Yeah. I mean, as a parent, you're just trying to get your kids through adolescence to where, you know, they make it into adulthood yeah. and they haven't killed themselves or somebody else or maimed themselves or somebody else. You know, that's setting the the goals at the very least. That's what you're hoping for, you know, but, yeah, and, um, I, and I think here's the example is, you know, as you start to go from an e-bike to an off highway motorcycle, if, if you're the parent that understands like, wow, okay, this thing goes 40 miles an hour, it should be ridden in these conditions. You might take additional steps, right? You might buy the helmet they're supposed to have a dirt bike, a DOT approved helmet. You might buy the mm -hmm. chest protector, the knee, knee protectors, the elbow protectors, mm -hmm. because you know that that crash at that speed is going to be worse. Um, so I was very, very bad at it, but I used to race, uh, motorcycles with AFM, the, where you'd go to like Sears point and kind of run around the track. I was middle of the middle. I wasn't very good at all, but I had a really bad crash going about 80 miles an hour, Whoa! but I had all of the gear on. I had a nice helmet. I had a one piece suit, thick leather, elbows, shoulders, knees, good adding on the hips. And even though I crashed at that speed, I was fine. Now, if I was wearing flip-flops, jeans, and a t-shirt, 
it would have destroyed my body. Yeah. And so that's the example. I may be able to ride my bicycle downtown Danville at 10 miles an hour with flip-flop shorts and a t-shirt, but I certainly wouldn't ride at any kind of speed with that. Right. I wouldn't do downhill mountain biking in that outfit. Right. right? When we go up to North star, we start putting elbow pads on knee pads. I start wearing a full face helmet cause I like to eat with my teeth. <laughs> and so I think if parents understood the totality of the risk that they're putting their kids on by putting them on different types of vehicles, they would want them to ride in the right conditions and they would want them to ride properly equipped. I don't think there's a parent. I mean, we live in a wonderful community and I don't think there's any parent out there that is maliciously trying to hurt their own child. Oh, no. I just think to yeah. Dave's point, they just may not understand. And when we call these things inappropriately e-bikes when they're not, we're doing a disservice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, bring up another point too, which I, 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 I want to get to the materials and that you've created uh, first in a bit, but the other thing which I'm going to harp on is, you know, that trajectory uh, that you have there, you know, the other concern I have, not only because of the way that has the frequency with which these are being written, which will increase the frequency of which those numbers happen, sadly. But I also sometimes have to think you got to look at those and multiply it by two, because just as the same number of people that aren't wearing it with your right helmet or wearing flip flops, there's a, a very high frequency of them riding and having their friend on the back, right? They're not just mm -hmm. riding you, whether they fit two or not. You know, the number of kids that are riding these and, and they got their buddy on the back, just the way that we used to have our friends standing on the pegs, you know, um, or sitting on our handlebars. And we rode double, you know, now they're riding double on these things. And so take that 50 percent and just unfortunately multiply it by two when they're when they're riding tandem like that. So that's that's scary. So Mike, I, Not only that, off, but I, I, I did see one of those trail bikes. So I walk or ride my bike to and from work every day. So I get to see a little bit more, I think. And mm -hmm. uh, I was walking home and crossing Camino Tassera, one of those major roads that you talked about was a girl who had a bicycle helmet on that wasn't even strapped with another girl on the back with no helmet. And they were riding one of those, uh, kind of trail looking bikes that are capable of going 30, 35 miles an hour. That's a disaster. Yeah. And so what a yeah. <laughs> little different response when you're chief of police, I can, I can actually call up the duty sergeant and have him go to the other end of the trail and wait for him. Uh, but how many times are those rides happening and no one's paying attention? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, about the, the stat that you shared, um, that's one vehicle moving, right? So you, you got somebody like a pedestrian's almost a stationary object, right? I mean, they yeah, might be that... moving a little bit, but when you're talking about somebody riding a bike and then they interact with a car, there's a vector there. And that, yeah. that's what makes the studies hard is you'd have to calculate based on that vector is, and is it closing or, and I'm, I'm not the traffic wizard. <laughs> I, I have, I have people on staff that are just amazing at that but you're yeah. you're absolutely right you you have whether or not there's closing uh is it direct impact is it a broadside you know what type of accident it is uh so this is the speed at impact is what they're measuring and oh, so okay. it could be very well it could be greater like we had one i think uh you know if you're religious or not, i think god was shining on this child this day because he was riding his mountain bike at about 15 miles an hour and he was going off the sidewalk and went into the road and as he did that, he overcorrected and literally fell into a car. And the only thing that hit the car was his head at his oh helmet. My gosh. And so the car was coming at him at 35 miles an hour. So he's coming at the car at 15 miles an hour. So that's not a 35 mile an hour collision. That's a 50 mile an hour collision. Yeah. And luckily, like I said, God was certainly shining on this, this young man. Cause he, he lived, wow. uh, and it was absolutely amazing, but, yeah, uh, yeah the closure rate is different. So you may be riding on a, a road that's going 35 miles an hour, but you may lessen or expand the speed of that collision based on the direction of travel. Yeah. 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 I, yeah, I don't know that, you know, to your point, I mean, we all grew up and did stupid stuff when we're young, had a lot of fun doing it. And that, that is out there. We just didn't have, I mean, I guess some guys had motorcycles, but I never did. And, and, 
you know, the, you're pretty limited what you could do on a bicycle. You know, well, my, it, I, I didn't have any motorcycles after my brothers did their thing. So my, <laughs> yeah. they kind of ruined it for me. I didn't get one until I was 19. So, oh, okay. Yeah. I had yeah. to wait a while, yeah. but yeah, there is a but proliferation of vehicles out there that are relatively affordable, at least in, in some communities where they're out there. So I think both Dave, you've mentioned this a few times. There's just a lot of them out there and, yeah. and people riding in excess speeds. And it's different riding a bicycle at 15 miles an hour than it is riding you know, a, an off-highway motorcycle at 40. Yeah. And, and to, Mike, to your point, right, which I think is a great point, right? Uh, you know, we did all did stupid, right? But we also didn't have the information, okay? I mean, like yeah. we go, we if we turn back the clock, right? I, I, was, saw, I was looking at something, some post the other day, you know, when cars didn't even have seat belts, right? Or yeah, you were right. able to sit in the back of your, your parents' station wagon with the third seat that, you know, fold it up and you were looking backwards. Oh, and like, all truck. these amazing, yeah. yeah. And 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 I'll go so far as to say, you know, DUI, right? I think we knew it was bad, but we didn't know, we didn't have all the data we have now, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm glad we're having this conversation because now we have data, right? And and it's a, it's just what can we do to get that information out there, right? It, there was a time which we didn't know, but now that we know, we'd be remiss if we weren't sharing and, sure. and just preaching the gospel according to safety, right? Well, and we, and we haven't really covered uh, some of the other things like these e-skateboards and then they got this one wheel thing where, you know, guys, I don't know how fast those things go, but it uh, doesn't seem like you have a ton of control on it. Um, so yeah, is there is there any, you know, restrictions on those products or are those open game that no there are and uh, a good example well and you said they don't look like they have a lot of control I, there's a guy that rides one of those one wheels and he's got one of those super fast ones and he's yeah. got like a full-on motorcycle helmet on all the gear and he is cooking and he looks like he's he looks like he has a great deal of control here's the problem that may be fine for his perception in his mind. Sure. But if he's going down something, and I, 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 I'm apologizing for using a lot of local references, but if he's going down the Iron Horse Trail, a community trail that's maybe eight foot wide with little kids and adults and bikes and tricycles and, you know, strollers, Dogs. and he's going 30 miles an hour, that's yeah. just too fast. Oh, yeah. You're not giving the other people that are using that area. Uh, enough room to do what they need to do. And so they're, they are restricted in some areas by ordinance, uh, by law, some areas are restricting them and, okay. and some are not. Uh, the bottom line is if you're going to ride a vehicle in the roadway, you have to follow the rules of the road. Yeah. I, I think I want to make a great a, a point there, Alan, and, and I know I'm guilty of it too, but a couple of things, all the things that we've described, the e-bikes, the e-scooters, the one wheel deals, uh, Please, audience, listeners, I'm all in favor of these things, right? Whatever gets cars off the road, whatever gets you um, to point A, uh, from point A to point B, safely, economically, ecologically friendly, right on, right? But just do it safely and know, know um, the rules, right? And the same thing, Alan, I, I, I know where you, you had mentioned you got to be off by five, so... Um, two, two other things that, that, and I know we're making local references and I'm guilty of it. Like I said, Camino Tassajara, you said Highland, but I, I submit that audience listeners take that out of the equation. If it's happening here, it's probably happening in LA, Atumbo, Iowa, you know, and, uh, you know, Erie, Pennsylvania. So I'm sure that this information is, is critical. Um, well, it, it's funny you say that because one of the references that we started using here when we started seeing it was a bulletin put out by the Orange County Sheriff's Office. And it was one of the, and I, uh, Dave, I actually sent you a link to that in a couple of the studies that I've referenced here. So if you want to post them, but the Orange County reference guide was so complete and so thorough. And it was clear to me, the cop brain, that this was a huge problem that they were attacking. And it just so happened a couple of weeks ago, we were down in Newport beach and you know how they have that beautiful trail, like right on the beach. Oh, yeah. And we were at a house right there. And all I saw was a big eight mile per hour sign on the ground and various types of electronic modes of mobility zooming by between 20 and 30 miles an hour. Oh, it boy. was 
wild and you see parents with their little kids trying to enjoy the beach and the walk and dogs, it just creates shower. a condition that is really really bad and yeah. so you're right know your local rules yeah well okay listen i know you got you have things to do and we certainly appreciate you taking time out of your day and educating us i mean i think the perception out there is it's kind of the wild wild west when it comes to these e-mobility but it really isn't and it's up to uh, you know, more education needs to be done and uh, there are rules out there. And if you own one of these vehicles, it's on you to understand how and where you should be able to use it and use it accordingly. So absolutely. Uh, and and I'll say this, it's, it's really great being in the community that I happen to serve in because as we started putting education information out, it was the cutest thing. There were a group of four boys that came up each with a different style of electronic mobility. And they mm -hmm. came up to ask our officers, Hey, can you explain to us the rules of the road? Is, oh, wow. Am I allowed to drive this one here? What do I have to wear? And yeah. we actually went out and took pictures because it was awesome. Here are kids at 12, 13 and 14 years old, frankly, showing more responsibility than sometimes we see with adults. And uh, I thought that is exactly what we want people doing. So if you want to come down and talk to your local police department and say, Hey, what, what is the right answer here? What should we be doing? We'd love to have you. We'd love to talk with you. Yeah. Terrific. All right. Well, look, you got to run. We got, you got another meeting in one minute. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks so much, Alan. Appreciate you Alan, being on the, yeah. on the program. Uh, fantastic as always. Thank you so much, Alan. Dave, Mike, right. I appreciate it. I love being on the uh, podcast. Uh, awesome. I, I actually listen to you guys quite a bit. It's very, I love the variety of people that you have on your show. It's very yeah. informative. So I appreciate being a, a small part of, of your show. And if anyone wants more information, you can always jump over to my podcast. It's called 10, eight in service. It's on the town of Danville's website. And we've done a whole series on e-mobility. So we've gone in depth on just each one of these that. devices. I was just going to ask that. That's great. Yeah. Oh, All right. fantastic. All right, Alan. Thanks so much. And Have a good uh, day. Thanks, thanks everybody for listening. Yeah. Enjoy we'll the see you next week.